Uh, good evening again, everyone. My name is Sheila Brown, and I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. The Centre is a joint initiative of the Atlantic School of Theology and St. Mary's University, and is governed by a, a, a board whose chair, Alan Shaw, is sitting in the middle of the room here. And on behalf of Alan and our board, and Chris Stover, our general manager, and myself, it is a great pleasure to see so many of you here this evening. This is the launch of part one of a five-part national series on trust in the new sciences. This series will explore the ethical, philosophical, and social implications of advances in the new sciences of genomics, neuroscience, and nanotechnology. And our speaker tonight on engineering selfhood in the 21st century is Dr. Nicholas Rose, who will be introduced more formally in a few moments. The series is made possible by the collaborative efforts of a number of organizations. First, of course, our own organization, the Canadian Center for Ethics in Public Affairs, but we don't like to work alone, and so we have partnered in developing this series with the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities mm -hmm. Research Council. The cluster is a seven-year project to promote new ways of bringing together leading scholars studying science and technology from multiple perspectives and to make that work accessible beyond academia. Part one of this series is also generously supported by Genome Atlantic, which shares too the mandate to stimulate discussion about the ethical implications of bioscience. And we're also very fortunate to have the support of Genome British Columbia for the presentation of part two of our series in Vancouver in January on personalized genomics and the future of medicine. As you can see on the overhead slide behind me, we will be in Toronto in March, focusing on the future of the body in the age of nanotechnology, in Montreal for part four on the neurosciences and their determination to explain the human, and we'll wrap up in Edmonton in April with a presentation and panel discussion on genes, genomics, and human nature with Dr. Evelyn Fox Keller, who will reprise her lecture here in Halifax on April 5th. Just so that you don't think you're missing out, we are taping all of these lectures, and in this way you'll be able to attend either live or when the lectures are loaded onto both the SACEPA and Situating Science websites. Or you can put your name on the, the sheet on the table outside as we produce DVDs of all our productions and they're available for purchase at a very reasonable cost. So once again, on behalf of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, I'm really delighted to welcome you and to express our Gratitude to our partners, situ the Situating Science Cluster and Genome Atlantic for working with us to bring you this these discussions of important topics. And now I'd like to hand things over to Dr. Gordon McEwitt of the University of King's College and Director of the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster to introduce our special guest this evening, Dr. McEwitt. We are very pleased to have Nicholas Rose, in part because he started as a developmental biologist, which we have many of them at Dalhousie. Uh, he uh, enjoyed washing bottles at his famous brother's laboratory, Stephen Rose, when he was a wee, a wee youth and fought with him over Foucault and Marx as he grew up. Uh, but Nicholas Rose turned to social sciences, especially under the influence of Michel Foucault. Nick, Dr. Rose is one of the world's foremost authorities on uh, Michel Foucault, 
And under that influence was the founder of the History of the Present Network, uh, which uh, worked on genealogies, the manner of Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality and Madness and Civilization, and also the managing editor of Economy and Society. At the London School of Economics, where he now uh, resides, he is the James Martin White Professor of Sociology and Director of the BIOS Institute or BIOS Center for the study of bioscience, biomedicine, biotechnology, and society. Uh, he's author of several books uh, from uh, the editor, uh, editor with uh, Rabinow of The Essential Foucault, from a psychological uh, uh, con uh, context, uh, inventing ourselves, powers of freedom, politics of life itself, and the most recent, governing of the present. And you can get all of these books outside, and maybe we can even convince him to sign a couple. Without any further ado, Nicholas Rose. Uh, Stalin says to his writers, he says, the production of souls is more important than the production of tanks. And therefore, I raise my glass to you, writers, the engineers of the human soul. So the question I want to ask today is, who are our engineers of the human soul and of the bodies to which our contemporary souls have become so attached? Um, who has the authority to speak the truth about what we are as human beings. And in speaking the truth about what we are as human beings, those authorities also gain the power to intervene on us as human beings. Has life itself, our bodies and our minds, become a kind of mechanism that's amenable to engineering in the service of our own desires? Is our vitality, whether it's human or non-human, merely now a standing reserve that we can use for our own ends. And if this is the case, should we, as Stalin suggested, raise a glass to today's engineers of vitality? And can we trust them? In particular, can we trust them when we know that our knowledge today of our bodies and our souls, the production of the scientific truths about ourselves, is dependent on the in uh, investment of very significant amount of both private and public capital on the politics of institutions and on a promissory economy of hope and hype. Well, I'm interested in this question because I think it's rather a fundamental one, and that's because I think our lives themselves are to some extent uh, at stake. So let me begin by... Uh, referring to a work by Ian Wilmot. Many of you may know Ian Wilmot. He was the person who came to fame because of his work on cloning Dolly the sheep. And uh, in 2000, he wrote an account of that work under the perhaps slightly provocative title of The Second Creation, Dolly and the Age of Biological Control. And in that book, he said the following, until the birth of Dolly, scientists were apt to declare that this or that procedure would be, quote, biologically impossible. But now that, impression, that expression seems to have lost all meaning. In the 21st century and beyond, human ambition will be bound only by the laws of physics, the rules of logic, uh, and our descendants' own sense of right and wrong. Truly, he says, Dolly has taken us into the age of biological control. This means that we can, to go on with uh, Wilmot's quote, this means that we can no longer assume that the biological itself will impose limits on human ambitions. As a result, humans must accept much greater responsibility towards the realm of the biological, which has, in a sense, become a wholly contingent condition. Well, of course, we know that this is scientific hubris. Um, some uh, may have, this may have some truth for bugs, some truth for plants, less so for bodies, and even less so for brains when there is very much that is biologically impossible. Nature says no to our aspirations 
as often as it says yes, if not more. And we also know that the translation from what's done in the lab on the bench in the petri dish to what's done in living organisms is, to coin a phrase, challenging. But nonetheless, uh, this points to something. It points to the belief that life has indeed become something like a mechanism, amenable in principle to re-engineering. And it also points to the centrality of this management of our individual and collective vitality to our contemporary ethics. So who are these engineers of vitality? And in whose name do they work? And who creates the kind of visions of the future, the visions of the future, which uh, this was the title of a BBC TV documentary, the visions of the future which guide and steer that scientific development, and who benefits from those? So let me begin with bodies before I get on to souls. Now, are these slides uh, relatively legible? Relatively legible. Well, you might see um, in the uh, top corner there a famous book uh, written by the Boston Women's Health Collective in the 1970s under the title Our Bodies, Ourselves. Now, when the Boston Women's Health Collective made that book, they didn't mean that we were our bodies. Their argument was that we should repossess, in particular women should repossess control of their bodies from all those experts from, from who had alienated their control of their bodies from them. But in a peculiar way, I want to suggest that we do inhabit an age where our bodies have become ourselves, where ideas of selfhood are intrinsically linked to our notions of what our bodies are. Our subjectivity has become embodied. Our hopes and fears are coded increasingly in terms of an understanding of our biological body. And our attempts to reform or cure or transform ourselves increasingly act through and on our somatic existence, our corporeal existence, our existence as vital living creatures. We reshape our visible bodies in all sorts of ways, through diet, through exercise, through tattooing, but more significantly, I think, today, we reshape the interior of our bodies. We view the interior of our bodies as something that we can work upon, we can understand, we can manage, and we can transform, both at the level then of our surfaces and at the level of our depths. We increasingly understand, speak, and act on ourselves and on the selves of others as the kinds of beings whose characteristics are shaped by our biology. And I've just stuck up on this slide, a few little examples of the kinds of things that I mean. But if we were to leave it at that, I think we'd miss a fundamental aspect of our contemporary ways of thinking about and acting upon our body. And that is uh, the emergence of what I've called elsewhere a molecular gaze. Because our understanding of our bodies now operates increasingly at the molecular level. We've moved from what one might term a molar image of life, the image of life that I put on this side of the screen from uh, Dr. Talp's anatomy lessons to the kinds of uh, uh, dissections of the body to show organs, flows of organs, of muscles, of blood, of tissue, which you began to see in the in the 18th and in the 19th century, these images of the organs that you see there, we've moved from that kind of molar gaze, that kind of clinical gaze that Michel Foucault talked about when he wrote his wonderful book on the birth of clinical medicine, to a gaze that now penetrates and understands the body at a completely different scale, at the molecular scale, at the scale of the interactions between events, functions, activities, interactions that happen between molecules. And I put some tiny illustrations of that on the other side of the screen. And in the move to this molecular vision of life, to use the title of Lily Kay's wonderful book, which traced some of that from the 1930s onwards, in the move towards this molecular vision of life, it appears as if all those complex vital processes in which life consists no longer need to be understood in any way by invoking any kind of vitalism. The complexity of these living processes can be broken down into simply understandable, engineerable, describable uh, 
interactions between specific kinds of parts. Complexity can be broken down into these parts, which can, in principle, then be reverse engineered. Because once you can break a complex process down into its little parts, you can reassemble, at least in principle, at least in thought, if not in reality, those parts together to produce a different kind of outcome. This is a kind of new ontology of life that I've referred to as a flat ontology of life. You no longer have to understand living processes by looking at deep, fundamental, underlying laws. What you see instead is a world of connections, a world of relays, a world of switches, which can be reorganized, reshaped, reconnected in different ways. Now, one of the areas where I'm working at the moment is in the area of synthetic biology. I don't know how much people know about synthetic biology, but synthetic biology is, if you like, the apotheosis of this way of thinking about vital processes. Vital processes can be broken down into parts mm -hmm. in the same way as an electronic machine or a mechanical machine can be broken down into parts. Each part can be specified, each part can be individually identified, and then those parts with their functions can be connected together to make something completely new. To use the title of an event which we're having at the London School of Economics in a couple of weeks' time, to create the organisms that evolution forgot. Now, in this new molecular image of life, vitality, the vital properties of living creatures, now seem as just a technical resource which we can instrumentalize, engineer, and capitalize at our own will. Something's happened to my little machine here, but never mind. Um, it's uh, interesting here that we're uh, uh, sponsored in part by Genome uh, Atlantic, because one of the key areas where one sees these developments occurring is in the way in which individual differences are now understood at this molecular level. This transformation of individual differences to things that can be understood at the molecular level, it seems to me, affects some rather fundamental transformations also in how we're able to think about ourselves. In genetics and genomics, as I'm sure many people here know, we've moved from a simple kind of genetic determinism in which we look for single genes for specific characteristics, the sort of gene for paradigm, to a different way of thinking in which multiple variations at the single nucleotide polymorphism level, where a C is substituted by a G or an A is substituted by a, a T, multiple uh, combinations of these single nucleotide polymorphisms shape our individual differences and in particular shape our susceptibilities to common complex disorders like depression. So we've moved from that single genes determinism uh, moment of thinking to a, a genomic moment of thinking, which thinks about multiple protective and predisposing sites, a kind of probabilistic way of thinking about the relationship between our genetic complement and our life chances. One of the most significant ways in which this has been manifested, which I know you'll talk about in some later uh, uh, lectures in this series, is in the emergence of genome-wide association studies. Uh, one of the conditions for genome-wide association studies is that the cost of gene sequencing has reduced astronomically. So it now becomes possible to do things that it was never possible to do before, which is to sequence a human genome at tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even a million different sites. Genome-wide association studies work using this kind of technology. Instead of trying to work out what genes might be responsible for uh, depression or what genes might be responsible for diagnosis or even what genes might be responsible for height or for weight. You take people with the condition and people without the condition, several thousand of them. You take genetic samples from them. You throw them into one of these vast, fast-acting gene sequencing uh, procedures and you simply look at the differences between those who have the conditions and those who don't have the conditions. And on the basis of the signals that you find when you do that, you may identify 20, 30, 50 sites that differentiate those people who have the conditions from those people who don't have the conditions. Now, I've put up on the screen here, if you can see it, some of the results which are often acclaimed of these genome-wide association studies uh, uh, for celiac disease, for atrial fibrillation, for colorectal cancer, for gallstones, etc., etc., etc. This has become the central paradigm of genomic research, at least in biomedicine. 
This is a probabilistic world which we have entered into because these combinations of single nucleotide polymorphisms in multiple uh, algorithms do not determine whether or not you're going to get a disease. They simply increase your susceptibility, your probability of getting that disease uh, in certain environmental circumstances. And they do so by identifying these things at the pre-symptomatic level. In principle, it becomes possible to identify those people, if you think through this style of thought, to identify those people who have a susceptibility to a condition before that condition actually manifests itself in, uh, in, frank, in frank symptoms. So the language that we're now moving to in this molecularization of individual differences is a language of predisposition, of risk, and susceptibility. Now, of course, the logic of public health medicine suggests here that if you can find people with predispositions for a particular condition before that condition arises, then obviously that's an advantage. Earlier is almost always better, say the people in public health medicine. Earlier is almost always better. So let's try and identify those conditions before they arise, and let's intervene in them early. This is a new logic, it seems to me, of regulating our ways of being in the world. It's a logic which I call screen and intervene, and it's one which is becoming central to the organization of health services, at least in their aspirations across the Western world. To know one's predispositions, to know one's fate, and to intervene in <coughs> one's fate in order to transform it. On the one hand, these screen and intervene logics have become very powerful in those seeking to organize public health systems. On the other hand, they've also become very powerful in the emergence of personal genomics, which I know you're going to hear about uh, uh, later on. These ideas that people might themselves have an interest, an interest in understanding themselves at this molecular level, an interest in understanding their susceptibilities, an interest in finding out who they are, obviously very clearly linked to the sense that your genes still do tell you who you are, to know yourself has become the basis of a powerful new business model in, uh, in genomics. I'm sure you know some of these companies, 23andMe, uh, Decode Me, Know Me. They're all about finding a knowledge of yourself at this genomic level. You send off a sample of spit, and uh, that sample of spit is subjected to genomic analysis. And on the basis of the genome-wide association study data, which I've uh, uh, just uh, alluded to, you get back two or three uh, weeks later for something between $450 and $4,000, depending on which service you want. You get back your uh, levels of susceptibility, your probabilities of developing anything up to 30 or 40 common complex disorders. There's a very peculiar kind of logic here because those uh, commercial companies that sell these, uh, these data say that they're not giving you information that has any medical relevance at all. Um, and in fact, in many ways, they're absolutely right because most of the information that they give you has no medical re relevance at all. It simply says that your chance of developing this disorder across your lifetime, instead of being 1 in 10,000, is 1.2 in 10,000. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, perhaps an intriguing uh, piece of data, but it doesn't give you anything which is clinically relevant for you to act upon at all. Nonetheless, this has become part of a whole much more general logic of screening and understanding yourself, of picking out these small susceptibilities, which in some way or other both do and don't give you a knowledge about the fate that you might, uh, you might be subject to. What are our customers saying? Down here, you probably can't read it. I thought, how fascinating if I could know more about myself. I should know. I should be aware for myself, for my children. If there's something that I could prevent for the future or live my life in a different way, why not learn? Why not help myself and be knowledgeable in that information for my health and well-being? Now, there are many, many things that one might want to say about personal genomics. Uh, ranging from the fact that if you send off your spit sample to two different uh, personal genomics com companies, you'll find quite different estimations of your risk levels and even of your hair color, eye color, and so on and so forth coming, coming back to you. Um, 
a, a second thing is that, of course, these commercial companies have a commercial interest in overclaiming the relevance of their data and in working on that double edge between saying this is interesting data which may have relevance to your medical condition. On the other hand, you should take absolutely no medical decision on the basis of the data that we give you. And it's also contributing the, to the idea that in this world in which we live, no one really is normal. Everybody has a series, as a, as, as a, uh, a scanner, not a, not a genome scanner, but a body scanner said to me uh, in a conversation the other day, no one is normal. Everybody's got a bunch of little anomalies. Everybody's got a bunch of little anomalies, but nobody knows which of those little anomalies are going to turn out to be significant anomalies. Nonetheless, this kind of way of thinking has become very, very celebrated as a radical transformation in the way in which we're able to understand ourselves. Nature, a little while ago, has on its front cover this message, your life is now in your hands. There was a famous uh, TV series uh, a while ago, uh, many years ago on the BBC, which featured doctors doing heroic things to save your life, and that was entitled, Your Life in Their Hands. But your life, in this way of thinking, is no longer in their hands. Your life is in your hands. I put at the bottom uh, the logo of the Beijing Genomics Institute, an organization which I've had a little bit to do with in some research which I've been doing in China. And this uh, on the side of the screen here, if my pointer would only work, um, is uh, the image of their uh, massive bank of Selexa sequences uh, in which they can sequence a whole human genome these days in less than a day. So they can sequence hundreds and thousands of genomes uh, in, a, in, uh, the, in a time that would have been inconceivable if you imagine how long it took to do the original sequencing of the first human genome. They sequence the first uh, uh, Asian individual, they sequence the panda, they're sequencing a thousand plants. This is sequencing on a massive level. We'll come back to the Beijing Genomics Institute in a moment, or at least to its uh, wonderful charismatic leader, China's Craig Venter, Yang Huaming. But before I get to that, let's have a little bit on the soul. So what I've tried to suggest in the first part of this talk is that through this molecular vision of life, this molecularization of our somatic existence itself, we not only understand ourselves at this molecular level, we, cannot, we can uh, reorganize ourselves at this molecular level. And in a certain sense, we are moving to a situation where we have to take responsibility for ourselves at this molecular level. Know ourselves, understand ourselves, and take responsibility for ourselves. Let's move briefly to the soul, which is um, where I've been working a bit these days. Well, it's quite easy to find these kinds of quotes from the uh, poster children of uh, neuroreductionism uh, that uh, articulate a view which I don't think they actually fully believe that mind is simply what brain does. Francis Crick's famous astonishing hypothesis, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more, no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. Or Patricia Churchland, um, in her work on neurophilosophy, says in this little quote at the bottom of the screen, there's no little person in the brain who sees an inner television screen, who hears an inner voice, reads the topographical maps, weighs, reasons, decides actions, and so forth. There are just neurons and their connections. And at the beginning of her more recent book, uh, BrainWise, she says, bit by experimental bit, neuroscience is morphing our conception of what we are. The weight of evidence now implies that it's the brain, rather than some non-physical stuff, that feels, thinks, and decides. That means there's no soul to fall in love. We do still fall in love, and passion is as real as it was. The difference is that we now understand those important feelings to be events happening in the physical brain. Events happening in the physical brain. So what's happened here is in a series of processes that would be very interesting to trace, and indeed in some of my work I am tracing out, the brain has become construed as an organ like any other organ. 
And the brain, too, can be anatomized at this molecular level in terms of the structure of neurons, synapses, receptor sites, ion channels, and so on. Each of these elements of this amazingly complex organ can be explained in terms of its specific molecular and biochemical characteristics. And mental disorders and mental pathologies are now envisioned as anomalies within those molecular systems. There was an old uh, distinction in psychiatry that did service for many years, and it was the distinction between organic and functional disorders. Organic disorders were, orga were disorders where you could actually identify something in the brain, some lesion in the brain that might be responsible for those disorders. But for the vast majority of things that psychiatrists were interested in, there were no such lesions. These could only be identified at the functional level. This Cartesian distinction, as some would phrase it, this Cartesian distinction has now faded away. All disorders can be understood in terms of the functional properties at the molecular level. And not just all disorders, but all normal processes too. Indeed, normal variations in perception, normal variations in cognition, normal variations in emotion are understood in exactly the same way as pathological uh, uh, expressions of emotion, uh, cognition, uh, and volition. The boundary that used to be a profound boundary and a disciplinary boundary between normality and pathology, which grounded a distinction between psychology, which always understood personality traits, and psychiatry, which always understood disorders. If you'd been a reasonably happy kind of a character and you suddenly plunged into despair, that was a state, that was something that psychiatry would deal with. If you're always a rather melancholy chap, that was a personality trait, and that was something that psychology would deal with. Two disciplines, two explanatory systems, two different modes of intervention. That itself has begun to blur. There is no distinction between the way in which you would understand normal variations and pathological variations. When the boundary between normality and pathology breaks down, when those interventions that you might use to, to to transform a pathology might also be used as interventions to modulate normality itself, then something really rather intriguing has happened in this neuromolecular gaze. Now, many social scientists looking at these phenomena have argued that what we've seen is a fundamental mutation in personhood. The French social scientist Alain Ehrenberg talks about the emergence of what he calls the cerebral subject and makes a, con a contrast between the sujet parlant and the sujet cerebral, the subject that speaks, who was always the subject of uh, psychoanalysis and indeed the subject of the human sciences, the subject in language, the subject in meaning, the subject in intention, as opposed to the subject that is a brain fundamentally a cerebral subject in which the brain has become a new social actor. Fernando Vidal uh, e extends this uh, metaphor by saying we've seen a transformation from personhood to brainhood. The idea that the human being is constituted essentially by the brain, not just having a brain. We're not just persons in this way of thinking that have a brain, but we're persons who are a brain. The statement I am a person and I am a brain become identical. Emily Martin's uh, work on bipolar affective disorder that many of you may have read, Bipolar Expeditions, uh, has been very, very critical of what she calls neuroreductionism in the social sciences. And Martin, like many of the others, who's, um, uh, Emily Martin's work I very, very much admire, seems to think that these cerebralizations of personhood pose a fundamental threat to the logic and the rationale and the work of the social and human sciences uh, down the generations. That in these ways of thinking, human <coughs> beings have been reduced to just their brains. Now, I myself somewhat unwisely a little while ago talk about, talked about the rise of something called a neurochemical self. But I think what I would want to argue today is that in these ways of thinking, Human beings are not reduced to simply their brains. But nonetheless, the brain as an organ is opened up to the same kinds of interventions, 
as the body, as a complex of organs, is opened up to a whole range of interventions. Across the first 70 years of the 20th century, and this is the work that I did in some uh, of the books that, uh, that Gordon was kind enough to refer to uh, earlier on, we see the emergence of the idea of the self as inhabited by a deep interior psychological state, a deep interior psychological space. And we understood, and understood ourselves and we understood others in terms of this deep interior psychological space, this psi-shaped space inside us, which was the place of the action of culture, the place of our biography, the site of our personhood and our personality, where our emotions came from, and indeed where we should intervene on if things started to go wrong. The discipline of psychology invented all those languages that we've used for 70 years or more to understand the way in which we act in the world, intelligence, personality, trauma, repression, the unconscious, inferiority complexes, and so on and so forth. And unlike many other disciplines and professions, psychology was very happy to give this language away to social workers, to uh, um, teachers, to probation officers, to prison officers, all began to speak a little bit like psychologists. And this language of the self appeared to enable those people who are managing human beings in all sorts of practices from the factory to the schoolroom to the family to manage the conduct of others in a way that seemed legitimate because it was based on a knowledge of what human beings really were. So I suppose the question then is if what I've said about the rise of the new brain sciences has any salience what's going to happen when these new brain sciences and these new ways of understanding human beings begin to move out of the laboratory and into the world. A lot of my social scientific colleagues are very fearful of what they regard as neuro-colonization, of the colonization of areas that had previously been the locus of action of the social and human sciences by these uh, ne uh, neurosciences. So we've seen the emergence of neuroeconomics, We've seen the emergence of neuromarketing. We've seen the emergence of neuropolitics. We've seen the emergence of neuroaesthetics. And indeed, we've seen the emergence of neurodating. All those activities that have the little prefix neuro to them seem to imply that now, if we're going to have a legitimate understanding of how people act when they buy things, when they believe, when they make decisions, when they make political choices, and when they make the choices as to who to date and, uh, and who to have relationships with. These things have to be understood at the level of the brain itself. So maybe there is some justification for those arguments that somehow, in some way or other, where psi was, there neuro shall be. That we're moving from this psi, or psychological complex, for the regulation, understanding, and government of our own behavior to what one might call a neurocomplex. There's certainly some evidence that that is becoming uh, the case. In the area of psychiatry, one has seen a great upsurge in neuropsychiatry. The argument all psychiatry really ought to understand all psychiatric conditions as conditions of the brain to be understood in terms of neurosciences. We've seen the emergence of neuro law, which asks questions about whether or not our legal system might be fundamentally transformed if we understood the origins of, of human behavior, the origins of human judgment, and indeed the nature of the, uh, the will that uh, the legal system work, works on, if we understood these in neuroscientific terms. We've seen a, the emergence of a powerful movement of neuroeconomics, saying that decision and choice needs to be understood at the neuroscientific level, at the neurobiological level, not at the level of psychology. And indeed, the choices that we make are usually made at levels which we are not even conscious of. And we've seen the emergence of those other kinds of areas that I've mentioned. So is this neuroscientific way of thinking moving from the lab into everyday life? Well, I think there's some evidence to suggest that it is. And I just want to give you one small bit of evidence here, which comes from a recent piece of work done 
in the United Kingdom, which was presented to our uh, Public Affairs, Public Administration Select Committee in the House of Commons a couple of years ago under the splendid title, Governing the Future. Um, and this is the idea of mental capital. This is the idea that one should understand the way in which uh, a nation might regulate its citizens in terms of the mental capital that they have. And that those nations who are going to do well in the world would do well to foster the mental capital of their citizens, and that that fostering of the mental capital of their citizens would be good not, for each not just for each individual, but for society at large. Mental capital is the uh, term that they use here to encompass, as they say, both cognitive and emotional resources. It includes people's cognitive ability, their flexibility and efficiency at learning, their emotional intelligence, their social skills, their resilience in the face of stress. This, the term, therefore, captures a dimension of the elements that establish how well an individual is able to contribute to society, and so on. Well, nothing particularly exceptional about that, except where is this mental capital located? Well, the picture on the screen tells the story. Mental capital is located firmly in the brain. It's neuroscience that's illustrated the crucial importance of mental capital. It's neuroscience that's illustrated the crucial importance of boosting brain power in the young and the old. It's neuroscience that's beginning to identify the markers that might enable you to predict learning difficulties as early as infancy. It's neuroscience that's going to enable you to pick the early markers of susceptibility for mental disorders and intervene. And indeed, it's neuroscience that's going to tell you how you're going to preserve a person's cognitive ability throughout their life. For those who've done the history of this, this is a, a, a kind of argument very familiar from the mental hygiene movement in the 1930s and 1940s, only now uh, uh, framed in entirely neuroscientific terms. So here's what you do uh, by charting the, le the uh, development of a mental capital over the course of life, marking all those things that might increase mental capital and trying to act on those, trying to eliminate all those pink down arrows that reduce the mental capital of each individual and society at large. So that's one way in which the neurosciences are, in my view, beginning to transform the ways in which we understand and seek to govern human conduct. Thinking of human activities, human capacities, and how we should act upon them in, in neurobiological terms. That, if you like, is a kind of regulation of behavior from above. But what one also sees is the regulation of behavior from below as increasingly, in terms of this kind of somatic sense of ourselves that I talked about earlier, increasingly, people begin to, just begin to understand the, the, their own selves and their capacities in terms of their brains. The brain is beginning to become a very rich source of narratives and techniques for making yourself, becoming familiar with your brain, acting on your brain, stimulating your brain, in some way or other, managing your own neural state. And here on the, on the uh, slide here, I've just put a few of the multiple kinds of sites which you can find on the internet which uh, argue that you should stimulate your brain through brain gyms, you should stimulate your brain through the brain diet, you should train your brain, you should seek to have a healthy brain, uh, you should uh, seek to maximize your brain power and so on. Why are we rather critical of those people who say that this is a reduction of personhood to brainhood is because what you see here are the injunctions to persons to manage their own brains. Become responsible for managing your own brain. Your ethics, your self-managing techniques have to include an understanding of and an intervention of your own brain. One of the key elements here is the, is the idea that the brain itself is amenable to being managed. The brain is flexible. The brain is malleable. The brain is plastic. And by your own endeavors, by your own action, you can take care of your own brain, not just for yourself, not just for the good of each, but also for the good of all. Because in doing so, you'll minimize the burden of brain disorders, and you'll minimize all those things that detract from the mental capital which I showed in the previous slide. 
So what we're seeing here, in the same way as what we saw in relation to the body, is the emergence of the idea that you are responsible for your body and you are responsible for your brain. And in having that obligation to manage your body and manage your brain, you'll not only help realize your own potential, but you'll uh, help the society in which you live. Okay, well just to move towards the end of this talk then. How have we reached this point when we can engineer, or we can believe that we can engineer both our bodies and our brains? What's shaped these imagined futures that are being ushered in by biotechnology? How can one understand that shaping? I don't think one can understand that shaping without understanding something about the the factors that shape the path of development of scientific knowledge. As I said right at the very beginning, at the opening of this talk, the path of scientific knowledge is shaped these days by the requirement for massive investment into, in producing this truth. Truth is contested, but the production of truth requires the investment by public or by private funds of very considerable sums of money. What becomes true is shaped by these visions of the future, and often by entrepreneurial visions of the future, marked by a kind of uh, venture capitalist entrepreneurship, which I've kind of indicated here by just showing you a few of the biographies here on, on, the, um, on, on this slide. Craig Venter, of course, um, driven by his own ambitions to force into existence a new way of thinking about human genomics, um, but maybe on this side of the screen, uh, someone slightly different, Zach Lynch of NeuroInsights, who makes a, a career and a business model out of forecasting the futures that are going to come into existence in this neuro age, and then teaching investors where they should invest their funds in order to bring these futures into existence. This imperative of translation this imperative to turn your scientific <coughs> discoveries into something that will both produce products, produce health, and produce money has become central to the very basic research agenda of the basic science. There's been a lot of work on aging, but I think if you go and talk to most people these days who are doing basic bio, uh, neurobiological work on aging, their work on aging is in a sense, it's infused with the idea that this work on aging might possibly produce an understanding of aging that might produce a form of intervention into neurodegenerative diseases that would not only produce massive advantages in the form of health, but also potentially massive advantages in the form of, in the form of wealth. The question that is posed to those of us in the social sciences is what role we might have in relation to those imagined futures because, of course, the social sciences imagine their own futures. In this field, we've seen the emergence of a whole set of new experts who help us understand ourselves in these new biomedical ways, who give us the language and the judgment to make sense of ourselves, and who we invest enormous hope in, the hope that they're going to find the cures for those diseases that ail us. We invest our trust in them, but we also uh, are constantly disappointed by the shadow that falls between the promise and the action. These experts, I suggest, are reshaping our very ideas of what we can hope for and what we can expect. And in a non-trivial way, I think those fundamental questions that Kant posed to us, what can I know, what must I do, what may I hope, are now being reposed in these somatic terms as our soma, our genome, our neurotransmitters, our biology is given crucial ethical state salience for the management of our lives, in which somatic experts articulate the rules by which we should live, in which we understand ourselves at least in part in these biological terms, in which our expectations are shaped by the, uh, by the languages, by the hopes, by the expectations that are given to us in these uh, scientific, these bioscientific areas and in which we're becoming to understand our bodies and our souls as things that we can manage and take care of for ourselves. So 
I said I'd come back to the Beijing Genomics Institute. Um, I understand, for those who ever liked that book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that a sequel to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has just been published. Those of you who read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will know that the answer to the ultimate question uh, about life, the universe, and everything in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was uh, 42. Uh, well, my colleague uh, Yang Huaming, who runs the Beijing Genomics Institute, recently uh, uh, gave a talk at a conference that I was organizing in London. And I've uh, taken the liberty of stealing his slides to lead up to my conclusion here. Because his slides suggest that, indeed, the answer to the question about life, the universe, and everything is 42. Or it's 4 plus 2. It's four, that's the four bases of DNA, C, A, G, and T. And it's two, it's the ones and zeros of the binary logic. Four plus two, from reading DNA, digitalizing DNA, and then beginning to rewrite DNA in digital terms. I mentioned synthetic biology. Well, it's uh, startling to know that there are now uh, 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 machines which you can place in, you can simply type in your digital code, and within the matter of a couple of hours, your DNA sequence that you have typed in will come out in DNA bases. So this is a new way in which life itself, at this most fundamental level, has become open to rewriting and to a kind of synthesis uh, by design. Well, in that very rapid overview, I've tried to suggest in a very preliminary and uh, superficial way that these developments in bioscience are indeed transforming what it is to be human, that our bodies and souls are now being seen as amenable to engineering in the surface of our own desires, that this isn't a question, as so many so, uh, social critics of biology have argued over the years. It's not a matter of biological reductionism, but it's opening multiple biological possibilities, multiple ways of transforming ourselves. It's not a question of normalization, because in these new ways of thinking, no one is normal. It's not a matter of therapy or enhancement, because in these new ways of thinking, there's no fundamental difference between intervening to control a pathology and intervening to enhance or to modulate a, na a natural capacity. But is, as nature puts on its cover, is our life in our hands, or whose life is our hands in? How should we take a view, how should we relate to this complex of truth and power, of health and wealth, that is reshaping our very sense of what it is to be human and our capacities to modify ourselves? Have we really entered an age of biological control where nothing is biologically impossible? Well, I suspect that we haven't. But whether this age of biological control is a reality or whether it's still a dream, it poses, I think, a fairly radical challenge to humanism and its ethics, to the idea that human beings are in some way separate from the rest of the world. We can engineer the rest of the world, but now we can engineer ourselves according to our own desires. We may live in a world of sense and a world of meaning, but we can transform ourselves not through acting on that world of sense and that world of meaning, but acting on our very vitality itself. There's a huge amount of hostility to these ways of thinking, especially amongst what uh, uh, I suppose in, uh, in, uh, in short one might call the continental philosophers in Europe. Because this is perhaps the most radical blow, the final blow to the narcissism of us human beings. We are not just amongst the animals, but we are engineerable machines. Should we resist or embrace that blow to our narcissism? Well, that's a question which each of us has to deal with ourselves. Thank you very much. Prominent question in my mind is the concept 
of self. I believe, although you used imagined for three times on the screen and in your talk, imagination itself was not once used. The concept of self, I and mean, this is King's University, this grew out of the church. Uh, Stephen Hawkins tracked science down to the doors of theology. My question is, with the loss of academic freedom and the corporatization and privatization of most research and the militarization of it, who is to determine, other than we the people, what our self is? And is it to be just a memory in a skin? Is it a community? Is it a community of all life? Is it a community of all that sustains that life? I believe that myself is all that I can possibly imagine. And I believe that's the same universally indescribable, unknowable, total self. But I am very much afraid of what may happen to this kind of knowledge. You spoke of Marx earlier and how he thought of people like me. I'm an artist. We create the self. <laughs> we saw what Mr. Stalin did with that. Uh, he used it to destroy humanity. And uh, I see it happening all around us. What do you, how do you respond to these ideas? I have to go this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think the idea that our self is in some way pre-social, given to us, understandable purely by intuition, something which the outside world can only corrupt, is very deeply ingrained, but I think it's fundamentally misleading. I think know yourself, that old, uh, that old cliche, know yourself. But how are you to know yourself? What languages are you going to use to think of yourself? What images are you going to use to render yourself into your own mind? What criteria are you going to use to judge what's good or bad about yourself? All those languages, those judgments, those images are historical. They're transformable. I think that the ways in which human beings have come to understand themselves, if one's talking at least about uh, the Western world uh, across the 20th century, have been profoundly shaped by the social and human sciences. As I tried to indicate, the languages that we use to speak about ourselves, the idea that we have this deep interior shaped by our uh, relations with our parents, uh, understood in, ter in these terms like uh, uh, trauma, repression, desire. These words that we use and the psychological coloration that those words are given, that arises not in some way naturally from our experience in the world. That arises from the forms of knowledge in the cultures in which we, in which we live. If those forms of knowledge transform, if those languages transform, if those judgments transform, then we may indeed come to think of ourselves differently. Is there something which we should regret? Should we feel nostalgic if that psychological, that deep psychological self is beginning to fade away? Well, many of my colleagues who place their faith, say, in psychoanalysis, would feel nostalgic. They feel this a bitter, a bitter blow, a bitter blow to think of yourself as neurobiological. But I myself wonder why that should be, why it should be so profoundly troubling to ourselves, to, in the same way as Darwin, who Gordon just mentioned, places us amongst the animals, why it should be so profoundly troubling to ourselves to think that in some way or other our feelings, our desires, our hopes, our wishes, our fears might be mechanism. Not merely mechanism, but in some way or other grounded in intelligible mechanism. I know that some people find that a very provocative, worrying thought, and I, I, I wonder why. Um, about 20 years ago, I attended a conference here with a very similar theme, and it was grounded in the technological dystopia literature of the 1960s, writers like Jacques Ellul and Victor Fergus. 
And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, people like Uglo Cerletti, uh, Igaz Moniz, and Jose Delgado, right? With Cerletti is the developer for electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, Moniz is the developer of lobotomy. And uh, Delgado, of course, is electrode implantation. And these things were all well worked out in the 19, well worked out to the extent that you can work out some things like this in the 1940s. Um, of course, you also had uh, radical experiments in the 1960s with drugs like uh, LSD, uh, with the, uh, the FBI and the CIA, at least. You know, I don't have the books in front of me, but that's my understanding. And we have the past 40 years or so of pharmaceutical uh, medication of the mind. So what I'm really wondering is uh, what's new in the model uh, that you're describing? Uh, I get that uh, the, uh, the mind becomes a brain. Uh, Cerletti made that statement. Moniz made that statement. Delgado made that statement. It was a necessary precondition to operate in the way that they did. And my intention is not to be critical in the sense of destructive of what you're saying, but I would like to know what's, what is the new angle that's coming out here? Is it the notion of incorporation, of self taking up responsibility for these things rather than the state? I, I wouldn't in any way want to, what I said to uh, sound as if I'm discouraging a critical attitude to what's happening critical in the sense of being able to make distinctions because it's only if one can make distinctions that one can make judgments um, and I think in order to make the distinctions one has to understand how these new styles of thought operate um, now th this isn't the place to go into the history the rather doleful history of, uh, of uh, surgical interventions on, on the brain um, but believe me, those people who are working in this field are very well aware of that doleful history of the lobotomy and so on. I think the difference here is, operates on a number of different levels. Firstly, it operates through the immense complexity of the machinery of the brain that is now being grasped. Secondly, it is that the brain now is seen as perhaps the most open, flexible, and malleable organ of all. So the idea that one's brain is fixed for all time and determines who one is, that idea has begun to fade away. Hence the idea that we can intervene on our brains in order to transform ourselves, and we can identify at a very precise molecular level how those transformations occur. Now, of course, a great deal of that is as much based on hype and hope as it is based on reality. You mentioned the history of uh, psychopharmacology, and we know very well that the early images of how those smart drugs like Prozac and the selective <coughs> serotonin reuptake inhibitors, we know very well that those early images of how those drugs worked, and even those early beliefs that those drugs were smart selective, targeted, only affected one small aspect of human uh, 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 mental processes without affecting others, that those were completely misguided. So none of what I would want to say here would be to deny that. All I would try and say is what new image of the human being is coming into existence here? Because like it or lump it, this is the image of the human being that we live with. You only have to look at the statistics of the use of psychiatric drugs across the world to know that we already live in a society where the modulation of our wishes, of our desires, our emotions, uh, it, by, by drugs is very common. In, uh, and, and perhaps one ought to think here not just of the licit, but also the illicit modulation of drugs. The use of Ritalin, for instance, is not simply in, uh, to, for the treatment of, uh, of kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Ritalin is very widely used, perhaps even on this campus itself, for individuals to modulate their own capacities, their own attention spans, and so on, for particular kinds of purposes. Maybe for good, maybe for ill, but that's the world in which we live. We already live in a world where the modulation of our lipid levels, the modulation of our uh, our blood pressures of all aspects of our body is routinely done by drugs. 
So at least some aspects of this world are not in the future. They are with us today. And we can't unwish them. We can't uninvent them. We have to understand how they work. We have to understand the conceptions of the human being that they're linked to. And to my mind, one has to understand the ways in which one might use those things productively rather than simply to have a romance of the natural, which would say, away with all drugs, away with these modulations, because that, frankly, is not going to happen. I have a question about the translational imperative, which sounded a bit to me like a vague critique of capitalism and how that plays into the production of scientific knowledge. And I guess that's my question is, one, is it a critique of capitalism? And two, if we believe in an alternative model or a future with a different economic system, can we then believe in a different thrust for scientific knowledge? Um, I would love to venture on a critique of capitalism and replace it with something nicer. Um, but um, in a sense, that all I was trying to do was uh, to describe how these pathways are shaped. And these pathways are shaped not just in the minds of the venture capitalists, uh, not just in the minds of the Craig Venters of this, of this world, uh, but they're shaped by those who invest publicly. Uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health in the United States are placing increasing focus on translational medicine. The Medical Research Council in the United Kingdom, which I've done some work with, is placing an increasing emphasis on translational medicine. This idea of translation, this idea that knowledge is to produce health, and the ultimate aim of these knowledges of ourselves is to improve ourselves, which is a noble aim, seems to me to have become incorporated into the very fabric of research design, of research funding, of research aspirations. At one level, maybe a lot of it is, uh, is window dressing. Many of the scientists I talk to say, well, actually, I'm just interested in my own little peptide, but in order to get the money, I have to claim that at some point in the future, this is going to help us cure Alzheimer's. And I know that there's a lot of that that happens. But it seems to me that that translational imperative is not so terrible, um, and that maybe there are bits about that translational imperative that one might want to embrace, because lots of us on the radical side of the agenda have argued that science should place itself in the service of social improvement, that basic science should in some way or other be uh, directed so that, it, uh, so that the money that we spend in it in some way or other improves the lives, especially the lives of the, of the, of the worst off. So that's one thing. The, the, the second thing is that it's very easy, I think, to, especially these days, to um, uh, portray the pharmaceutical companies as the villains of the peace, uh, portray the venture capitalists as the villains of the peace. Um, but I don't know of any drug that's been brought to market uh, without that imperative of making a profit out of it. Uh, I think the operation of the pharmaceutical companies is highly problematic and needs to be investigated and needs to be transformed and the kinds of structures of reward which they operate within and the claims which they make about the cost of bringing drugs to market and so on and so forth need to be very rigorously investigated. But I don't think one can imagine a time in my time, perhaps in yours, when the production of these kinds of uh, interventions uh, is going to become possible outside market conditions. So the question is how... Sorry? Yes, I know. Uh, Joseph Salk uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, he's on the Ed Murrow show. You can see this on, uh, on YouTube, actually. And he's being interviewed by Ed Murrow. And Ed Murrow says something like, if I get this right, Dr. Salk, who owns the patent on your vaccine? And he says in that famous way, the patent? There is no patent. You might as well patent the sun, he says. Um, I gave a talk on this recently, actually, in, in Singapore. And I contrasted this with a document from a Danish university that I'd come across. And this document from a Danish university, which was encouraging closer relations between the university and industry, was headed uh, from thought to invoice. From thought <laughs> to <endless. laughs> so I'm, I'm not, I am not, I am not 
defending what you call the corporatization of the university. Um, but I am saying that if you want to understand how this is operating, if you want to describe and understand the transformations that are happening, it's perhaps necessary to step back a little bit from the criticism to understand the processes and the transformations. That's a feeble answer, I know, from someone who began, who began with the... Yeah. Um, so I think that a lot of uh, what you've presented here points in some ways to uh, questions about reproduction as well as questions about neuroscience. I think that the idea of mental capital especially um, uh, and, and the way that countries, especially in the Western world, are trying to deal with population decline and, and some uh, issues that will result in skill shortages and knowledge shortages and these kinds of things um, are questions that need to be thought about. And I guess I'm just wondering if any of your work around um, the genome or around the, around the construction of the self around this new biological or this idea of the biological has come across um, how this has been mapped on women's bodies as opposed to maybe women's brains in the same way. So we're seeing more policies that want to treat women as who are prior to age of reproduction as pre-pregnant. So they're supposed to take care of their bodies in, in the interest of um, making sure that environmental factors don't uh, contaminate their future children or like these kinds of ideas that are um, in becoming increasingly prevalent uh, and using the the content the content of new biological discovery and new genome research. I mean, I, I think the short answer to your question is yes, um, but I don't think there's anything too new in that argument that uh, women ought to preserve their bodies as temples in order to produce the best possible offspring. Uh, <laughs> for their families, uh, for the race, and for the nation. I mean, you can trace those arguments back um, to the beginning of this century and, and, and before. Um, so the, re the responsabilization of women for the management of their own bodies in the interests <coughs> of procreation, I think, is not particularly new. On the, on the other hand, um, It would, I think, be a mistake to argue that this could be understood as the simple imposition of a set of obligations on women by a state that only had the interest of managing its own population. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I do some work in China. And one of the interesting things in China, which, as everybody knows, has had the one-child policy for many, many years, is the um, great interest in, uh, in assisted reproductive technologies in China. Um, there's a great desire for uh, use of assisted reproductive technologies in China, despite the fact that they are all paid for out of pocket. Uh, the desire to have a child, indeed the desire to have the perfect child, seems to be something that has been implanted, whether uh, by, uh, by a state or by other means, in, in many, many people within the Chinese population. So to some extent, this is not simply an imposition from above, but it's also a movement from below. And I think unless one tries to understand that dynamic and the ways in which what starts off as an imposition becomes an aspiration and then a demand and then a right, as, we, as we've seen in the, in the UK, for instance, where the demand for, uh, for assisted reproduction uh, has been turned into a demand that that right be met and that that right be met on our National Health Service. Some infertility has become a, a disease, a treatable disease. So I think you need to understand that dynamic in order to begin to address the question that you're talking, that you're talking about. Whether we're seeing, as, as, as some people have suggested, uh, a kind of re a general reformation of a politics of the population, a politics which takes the size, the quality, the dimensions of the population as a whole, as its object, as we saw across the 19th and the first half of the 20th century, that I'm not so sure about. And that, I think, would be interesting to have a, have a debate about. I think these things operate far more at the level of the individual than at the level of the management of populations as a whole. <laughs>
um, when you said at the beginning of your talk and also at the very end that uh, what becomes true um, is shaped by visions of the future, um, and you certainly presented a few of these visions, I think one could also term that uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, maybe that statement itself is even a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I think um, you first have to accept the basic premises um, on which all these visions and prophecies are based. And I would like to say that um, when you, these premises on which they are based, some of them, they might not be um, so true as they seem. Um, when you go from, you presented the example of going from psi to neuro, and that all kinds of new things, neuro um, politics and so on emerge, I would say it doesn't emerge. These are just sort of side effects, some, maybe some um, fringe sciences, some proto-sciences or something which um, happen, but the real emergence takes place when you go from new to psi, when you go from the more fundamental uh, science to a, um, from the more abstract to the more practical one, going from physics to chemistry or from chemistry to biology and so on. And uh, when Francis Crick said that uh, our souls or minds are just a vast assembly of neurons, I think that just shows his ignorance and his arrogance. And even he might have been a uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, you certainly also know that he won a Nobel Prize by stealing other people's research. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think just that, uh, um, can you comment on um, how um, strongly do you think it is true that by understanding the molecular basis of life, it is possible to understand life itself, and uh, maybe also related to uh, the underlying physical laws, because you, don't, you cannot just go down to the new ones. You can even go further down. You can go down to the fundamental particles of physics. Most people don't do that because they don't understand quantum theory or um, field theory or so on, so it just stops at um, the new ones, but um, you certainly can go further. Okay, well, there's a, there are a lot of things in there. Let me try and s s sort out just two. Uh, just to correct um, misperception, perhaps. Um, when I quoted Ian Wilmot saying the idea that something is biologically impossible has ceased to have any meaning, I wasn't agreeing with Wilmot. I think he's quite wrong about that. I think there are many, many, many things that are still, and probably will be for many years, impossible, biologically impossible that the brain repair, for instance, is one of the things which at the moment we have no idea how we might, how we might do. We have uh, small hints as to how that might be possible, but if you talk to most neuroscientists who work on strokes, say, they suggest that some aspects of how you might transform an adult brain that suffered a stroke are both biologically unknown and at the moment biologically impossible. So what I was trying to suggest by that was not that Wilmot captured a reality, but he captured a certain way of thinking. A certain way of thinking that if you can only reduce life to mechanism, then you can transform it at will. And this way of thinking, this style of thought, this emergent style of thought, is what I think is so powerful here, and what I was trying to, what I was trying to uh, uh, characterize. Um, so that's the the first part of what I was saying. So the second part of what, what I was try, trying to say is uh, links to your question. Because I think it would be a mistake to believe that the kind of bold neuroreductionism of Francis Crick or Patricia Churchland does characterize how people are thinking about mind-brain relationships these days. I don't think they're thinking that you can simply reduce mental processes to physical occurrences or molecular occurrences in the brain. They certainly haven't solved the mind-brain problem. And if you listen to the neuroscientists talking about these things, they'll say, well, these mental states are modulated by, they're related to, they're shaped in, they're grounded in, they're reflect, they reflect brain states. 
There's something about that emergent set of properties that is certainly very, very far from understood. And I don't think at that level, neuroscience has got much closer to solving that fundamental philosophical question of the relationship between mental states and brain states. And indeed, what you begin to see in the, the developing neurosciences is the beginning of a questioning, not a fundamental questioning, but a reframing of this uh, engineering paradigm. You begin to see people asking questions about systems, asking questions about emergent properties, asking questions about things that happen at one level that cannot be reduced to or explained by things that happen at another level, but yet are in some sense that we don't quite understand dependent on them. So some would suggest that perhaps we have, we're not at the end, but we're nearing the end of where we can go in this simple engineering model of the human body or of the human brain. And we need to move to a way of thinking which we aren't quite capable of doing yet, which is a way of thinking genuinely about complexity and about emergence. Now, mostly when people talk about complexity and emergence, I'm reminded since, uh, as was said, I, I, I spent my younger days as, as a Marxist, um, uh, uh, and uh, those of you who have ever done any historical studies of this ancient, ancient uh, set of doctrines will know that when Marxists tend to talk about things and the relationship between one thing and another which they can't quite explain, they say, well, it's a dialectical relationship. <laughs> a dialectical, to say something is a dialectical relationship is a mark of explanatory failure. And in most cases, to say complexity and emergence is also a mark of explanatory failure. So the challenge, I think, to those who want to talk about a, a kind of materialism, a materialism of the human that's not the engineering model, is to try and find ways of thinking about complexity that go beyond explanatory failure. One does see this, actually, in, in some areas in the, in, the li in the life sciences, and it's very, very impressive. And the other thing that I would say, just since we're probably getting towards the end of our time here, is that... Um, I think those of us who work in the social sciences should be very critical of bringing our own hermeneutics of suspicion to the, to the natural sciences and thinking in some way or other that our ways of thinking are more complex, more sophisticated, and more able to deal with complicated phenomena than, they, than theirs are. If you look at the way in which, say, someone would try and explain type 2 diabetes and the complex cascades, interrelations, and transformations that go on there, these are forms of complex thought that put most of what happens in the social sciences to shame. And if you look at what's happened in, in genomics, if you look at the things which are now capable of being done, which would never even be conceivable before, which build on the inventions of multiple, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual scientists which are put together and black boxed in those selects or sequencing machines which I stuck up on, the, on my slide, you, you have to have a little bit of humility here. You can, of course, be critical of the scientists, but I think you need to be critical in a way that will work with and recognize what is capable of being done and try and move that in ways that are more, uh, are, are more directed towards what my colleague uh, Paul Rabinow would call human flourishing. Oh no, all this, <coughs> all this pressure. Um, th th there seem to be two things you're talking about, and I'm wondering about the relation between them. Uh, some of the things in, in the, um, uh, the answer you gave to the last question help, but I uh, want to uh, see just, just what the relation is. On the one hand, there's this technology, or as you rightly say, this promise of a technology, and then there are all sorts of questions about um, uh, in whose hands this technology will reside, who will control it, um, will we control it, will... Uh, uh, someone else, but then on the other hand, you talk about um, uh, different conceptions of the uh, of the human self, um, and I'm wondering what the connection is. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me that our conceptions of ourselves, uh, our conceptions of, of ourselves as persons, have much to do with Cartesianism or uh, connection between uh, mind and and brain. But uh, perhaps you could tell me what the uh, uh, what the self um, the human self is, that's not what it is in reality, but what, uh, what, it, what it used to be and what it's becoming to be. 
And is the relation between the, um, the, the evolution of this new technology and this change, um, did the, uh, the, the change in, self in conceptions of selfhood uh, cause this technology to become um, um, attractive to us? Or has the technology grown and, and, and it somehow changed uh, the co uh, conception of self? So um, uh, first, uh, how is it that um, the technology or the promise of this technology is changing something like um, our conception of ourselves as loci of uh, consciousness with rights, uh, able to conceive projects, uh, put them into, uh, into, in, into, um, into action. And, and then secondly, um, if, if these two are related somehow, uh, what direction does the causation go? Oh, I'll, I'll deal with the second one first, because I mean, that's a question has, that's very well avoided. Um, like a like a heavy meal before going to sleep. Um, I mean, the idea that there's some single direction of causality here that can be uh, uh, characterized in a, in, in a moment is, I think, completely mistaken. What one sees is the emergence of transformations as a result of things that happen along multiple, multiple different pathways. These pathways can be traced out there's no difficulty in tracing them out. It just requires a little bit of patient, gray, detailed, mundane, historical work. Um, and uh, some of us have, have done that. But it's not a question of any simple causality. That, just let's go to, to your question, which really just takes us right back to the very first question that, that I was asked here, which is about how human beings come to think of themselves as certain kinds of creatures the question of historical ontology. I, my, my work and my interest is not in what human beings are. I don't know what human beings are. For thousands of years, human beings have asked themselves who they are. Maybe what human beings are are the kinds of creatures that always ask themselves, what are we as human beings in our present? And what kinds of creatures are we? And what makes us different from other kinds of creatures? And I'm not being completely, I'm not being about that. I think that question is a question which goes back many millennia. Then how is that question answered, that question, what are we as human beings? It's answered differently at every historical moment. There's no unity, no continuity about how we answer that question of what we are and who we are, of know yourself. Know yourself, fine, but how do you know yourself? I'm simply repeating what I said to the very first question. You can, uh, you can only know yourself, you can only establish a relationship with yourself, unfortunately, through certain grids of meaning and of language and of judgment and, of, uh, and certain images. Um, and those meanings, those languages, those judgments, those images are, to be very crude and simple about it, since we're uh, late in the day now, they're cultural and they're historical. Now, the argument that I would make, the argument that I have made, the argument that my friends say, I, the only argument that I've been making for the last four decades, uh, is that those ways of thinking have been shaped since the middle of the 19th century by developments in, pos in our positive knowledges. These arguments have been taken away from philosophy and placed in the domain of positive knowledge. And you can see this battle. You can see this battle happening in the late 19th century as psychology begins to occupy the ground that was previously occupied by philosophy. And experimental psychology begins to claim that it's in a positive knowledge of the human that we can begin to understand all those questions that philosophers have asked for generations. Now, I don't say that every human being has become a little psychologist, far from it. But what I do say is that the languages, the beliefs, the techniques, and the judgment of these positive sciences have penetrated far and wide across our culture. From the idea of intelligence as something that varies from human being to human being, that can be characterized, that maybe is distributed along something like a normal curve. Some people have more of it, some people have less of it. The idea that we have things like personality, 
What was a personality? The very idea of personality invented in the late 19th century. Now we say with glibness, oh yeah, my personality is this, he's a personality, your personality is this. Personality takes over from an earlier notion of character. And one could go on. Ian Hacking, doing very interesting work on the idea of trauma, has done some of that work on historical ontology as well. And one can look at almost all these terms which human beings use to characterize themselves. Now, of course, we've not all come to talk like psychologists. We use different languages in, to be Weberian about it in different departments of our lives. But I happen to think, and I, I would argue this if we had more time, that psychology these psychological languages have had the capacity to infiltrate ourselves, to infiltrate themselves into the bedroom, into the church, into the prison, into the factory, into the, uh, into the, into the army. Um, and they have transformed the way not only in which our authorities think about ourselves, and that cannot be denied, but the ways in which we ourselves have come to think about ourselves and judge ourselves. I'm simply repeating myself here. So if this is the case, if the way in which we understand ourselves depends in part upon the authoritative, authorized knowledges that are given to us by experts, then as those authoritative, authorized knowledges transform, so will our ways of understanding ourselves, and so will our ways of acting on ourselves and judging ourselves. And I gave some trivial, superficial examples here of the way in which these notions of the brain as the object which you should take to try and improve yourself have become very widely circulating. The brain as something which you can act upon yourself. Whether this will last, I don't know. As I said in the discussion that I had with some, some of you who are, who are here earlier on today, I don't think we're at the beginning of something or the end of something. There's not some fundamental change. Where it's not an epoch that's ending or an epoch that's beginning. We're in the middle of a transformation, and we don't know how it's going to end. But writing in the middle, I think it's possible to begin to identify some new figure of the human that's beginning to emerge, and uh, that's uh, what I try to characterize uh, crudely, superficially, uh, and uh, all too briefly today.